Wanna talk? So let's talk. Yeah. Talk. You wanna talk. You gotta talk, you need to talk. News talk. I talk, you talk to Solomon. I talk, you talk to Solomon. Yeah, let's talk to Solomon. Welcome back to Talk to Solomon. We're having a discussion here. I'm Stan Solomon. I'm the host. I'm Chief Steve Davis, the co-host. And also co-hosting with us is my friend Greg W. Howard, a financial expert. But uh, we're talking about what everyone's talking about right now, the tragedy, the, the unspeakable evil that the world saw in the murdering by a son of his mother, the murdering by that same 20-year-old son of the, the principal and, and the teachers at the school where he went in a small community in Connecticut, and then the unspeakable, inconceivable horror that he mowed down the kids, six- and seven-year-olds, in those classrooms, shooting them enough times to make sure they were dead. One child survived by playing dead. Other children ran. Other children were hidden, and they bolted from their place of hiding, trying to get away, and he shot them down. 20 children. 12 girls, 8 boys. All the adults that were killed were women. Now, we could go a lot of ways with this discussion. The president, the first lady, who I consider to be, you know, horrible people, while the bodies were still warm, they were pimping, they were posturing, they were running as fast as they can, running faster than a, a black pimp at a, at a, at a, a, a public event like Sharpton or jo uh, Jackson to be there and absorb the spotlight. You remember how George Bush, whenever there was a tragedy, would try and stay away from the spotlight, not be the issue? Obama is exactly the opposite. He's exactly the opposite. He's a low-class, low-life, lily-livered loser. And those are the good things I can say. But having said that, immediately he said, we, America, has to change. Really? What do we have to change, President O, kiss my butt? What is it that we have to change? We didn't do anything wrong. The guy who did this was one of yours. He was a leftist. He was a vegan. He was a liberal. He was a... Uh, anti-everything, just like you are. And he did something that he, he wasn't supposed to do, had been told not to do, uh, and allegedly stood against, and that was do wrong, do evil, hurt people. He was a vegan because he didn't want to hurt an animal. He didn't want to make a chicken lay an egg. And he looked like it, by the way. He was emaciated. And then he did this horrible thing. Now, the video games, why, Sam, what's that guy's name, Samuel L. Jackson? Oh. Well. The, the foul-mouthed, low-life piece of black crap. Uh, he said, well, it's not to fall the movies or the video games that he's in doing all this kind of stuff. It's never their fault. Senator Lieberman says it is their fault. Frankly, I don't know whose fault it is. I don't know whose fault it is. I don't think that anyone saw this coming. I don't think that, 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 you know, there was a mental health bill that they tried to pass in Connecticut that would have allowed for the, you know, involuntarily medicating and or uh, holding someone with mental illness. I don't know if that would have been right or not. At any rate, we're just talking about it. Uh, let's go to Greg. Well, I want to talk a little bit about these gates. Um, now, as you know, I was a Marine. I know a little bit about military tactics. I know a little bit about military training, and I know a heck of a lot about firearms in a tactical situation. I watched my son at the time he was 16 playing one of these black ops something or other games, and he says, Dad, watch this. And he was going through the game's motions, and he says, I'm a pretty good fighter, huh? I said, Son, you've died four times in the last five minutes. No, you're not very good. As a matter of fact, what I'm watching is an absolute disaster of tactics, you have no idea what you're doing, 
And if you tried that in real life, you'd have your brain splattered like you just did four or five times in the first five minutes. This game isn't teaching you anything except that if you die, you get to pop back up again. I said, this is not anything but a shoot 'em up game. And honestly, I really don't care for you playing it anymore. And he, he, he was kind of taken aback by this. He thought, oh, wow, I'm really cool. I'm shooting up all these things. He had not actually taken a moment to realize that he was, he was dying every, two or, you know, every minute or so in the course of playing this game. He, it had not dawned on him for one second the reality of what was going on. It was, it was complete desensitization. And sometimes as parents, I think all the time as parents, we have to step in and put the dose of reality because the games are very realistic looking, except to the point where someone feels the pain of a bullet ripping through their chest or their head exploding off their shoulders. And that is the problem with these games, and they're way too common. There are too many people using it, and what it does is it desensitizes the shooter that their target is a human being. Now, in the military, we were never desensitized, contrary to what people think about military training and programming and brainwashing, and Chief will bear this out with me on his mili- in his police training. We were never desensitized that the person we might have to shoot was anything but a human being. And our job, yes, was to inflict a casualty, but it was never to go through a village or go through a hamlet or a town spraying indiscriminately everything that moved. Chief? No, I'll certainly back that up, but also with my military training as well, like you said, in the military and in law enforcement, we're, we have to identify targets and, and only shoot or destroy the targets that are our enemies, not, not friendly targets, so that's very important. But the story you told about your son, to me, uh, is, I think is important as well because <clears throat> while your son watched and played all these video games, he's not out shooting at people at a school. And I think most kids that play these games, well, I know most kids that play these games, uh, they don't take those games and then take that to the next step in real life and go out and blow up a school or shoot kids or kill anybody else. So I think most of us uh, that don't have mental problems, maybe the game is not a good thing for us, but it's not enough to send us over the edge to go out and kill a bunch of people. Well, let me piggyback on that because, Greg, you've made a great point. And, Chief, I would tell you that a lot more than we realize, people are affected. I mean, let's forget the video games for the moment. Let's talk about wrestling, which everyone with an I and a Q knows is fake, right? Well, no, 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 no. Some wrestling is fake. Go watch a high school match. It's no, not no, that's fake not really. I agree. Okay, all right. I'm talking about the w- WWF, okay. the so-called professional, which is it, it's showmanship. But how many young people, we've had cases where kids eight or nine have killed a five- or six-year-old doing those things. We need, in my opinion, to do more to make sure that before, during, and after watching or performing or playing in these games, it's like today when you get a toy gun, it has an orange ring, right? I, I'm saying... But most of them have some, or, or, the, or the whole gun is orange or a different color. I'm gun. just saying that, that to try and at least reinforce the point, this is not real. We need more in these video games. Maybe uh, uh, something that's there while they're playing the game that says, this is a game. You can't, shouldn't, must not, uh, and, and cannot take this into real life because it's wrong. Something to that effect, I think, does make sense. Just like we have disclaimers on movies, which many people fought, but I'm, I believe that if you're going to have profanity, nudity, sex, violence, that people before they watch the movie should know that. Parents before they let their kids watch it should know that. So that and you have the ratings. I think we need to have a discussion about making it more obvious. Now, you can't get through to everyone. We may not have gotten through this fella. What was his first name? Who? The killer. I'm not going to say it. I'm okay. not going to mention his name to anybody. Dumbass. But whatever. My point is, it may not have gotten through people like him, but it would. The, when you talk to people that live in the inner city, when you talk to people that 
that that deal with other people's kids where there's no dad, there's no real control. These kids act out. You saw two young black kids in this particular case, and another case where there was four white kids, where in the one case, these two black kids were following this guy saying, give me some cigarettes, give me some cigarettes. They were 13, 14 years old. The guy said, oh, man, I haven't got cigarettes. And, and, but when they got to the, the, where he lived, his girlfriend came out and said, hey, guys, go get a job. They pulled out guns and shot her dead. And then they posted it on Facebook. Hey! Hello! And the police car. I think that they don't know the difference. That doesn't mean they shouldn't get the death penalty, and I'll personally carry it out, but I'm telling you, there are not one, not ten, not a hundred, not a thousand. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of young people that don't know the difference between right and wrong, and they don't know the difference between reality and fantasy. Chief? Well, I believe that that's true, and there's a lot of violence that we've already discussed. There's a lot of violence, even with hand guns, that does not get reported. You mentioned Chicago and all of those, all of those shootings in Chicago that don't get reported, and it's, it's almost like they don't really exist. It's not that important because it wasn't a mass shooting. But I want to throw something else out here, too. You, all of these are happening by men, young men, not young girls, young men. And we're, we have a chemical makeup, a, a physiological makeup that's different than girls. And men have to do something. They have to have some type of activity, some type of energy. And I believe what we should be doing now is teaching our young men how to be superheroes. Give them something good to do with all that energy and that activity. Make them the protectors of the, of the weak. Make them the protectors of the women. Give them a superhero status and something to use that energy for rather than just like Greg's son was playing this video game that he, he didn't like. Let, we need to encourage and, t and find ways to teach our men, our young men, how to be superheroes and not just video game players or, 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 or bad people. Greg? Well, there's no question that uh, young men have a uh, greater proclivity to violence as part of the testosterone, as part of the wiring buildup of uh, the brain. It's why traditionally and almost exclusively until the last uh, few years, men have been picked up and used for battle by nations, etc. The problem being is that we have also, in the last 40 or 50 years, pretty much run the father out of the house in many respects. We've had the Murphy-Brown phenomenon. Uh, we have removed effective role models from young men, not having a father around to teach these young men how to be men. So we have these very aggressive young people um, with their natural aggression, not channeling it correctly. We have cut back in many ways some effective means of uh, dealing with their aggression in terms of sports and so forth due to insane budget cutting in the wrong areas, uh, while we do insane budget enhancement in other areas that are just a absolutely out of their minds. The problem being is that we have had a societal and moral decay unlike anything that can be imagined. And, of course, you know, this is part of the all-out war on America. If you want to destroy a nation, you have to destroy the three things that make it a nation. You have borders, language, and culture. Our borders are gone, pretty much. Our language is under assault. Uh, you, you know, how many buttons are there going to be to press for language anymore on the phone? And then, of course, our culture. You know, I, I was watching, I was going through the movie selections the other night, and I saw some really old, great movies available back in the day when Hollywood was actually patriotic. These were old war movies. And you'd see greats like Ernest Borgnine and people like that, you know, that really wanted to portray America as good, wholesome, and decent. And it was amazing the number of these Hollywood folks that had actually served in the military and then came back and made the pro-America movies afterwards. As compared to today, America's always the bad guy in the movies. And all the movies, you know, like, for example, the latest movie by Jamie Foxx, we're, we're working to try and get as big a boycott as we can because... Jamie Foxx has come out and said, our Lord and Savior Obama. Our, our culture is under complete and total assault, and they have been working on this for the last three decades at least at the theater. So, you know, we have got a multiple, a myriad, I'm, I, I'm sorry, the word I'm looking for is a myriad of problems in our culture, and it is all by design, 
And it all started with the removal of the father, the breakdown of the family, because that was the last area that was safe for young men and young women. And we have destroyed that last safe area. And here we are now with a bunch of young people that have no moral guidance, and now they're roaming the streets of Chicago and large areas with easy access to guns, and you wonder why we have killings all over the place. And if they didn't have easy access to guns, they'd have easy access to bricks. Right, and it's not the access to guns that's the problem. It's the access to guns with no laws to to punish them severely for it, and the fact that the, their targets are un, un, are unarmed. You know, gun-free zone just means, hey, shoot fish in a barrel in here. Yeah, gun-free means, hey, criminals, there's no one legal that will have a gun here to protect themselves. That's what that No means. one here to stop you. But let me back up on that just a moment. In Clackamas, Oregon, the guy went in there with an assault rifle, which he apparently didn't know how to operate, thank goodness. It jammed after he shot two people, and while he was trying to unjam it, there was a guy in there who was carrying a concealed weapon, a citizen. He probably should not have had it because it was a gun-free zone, yet he pulled it, and he was trying to get a shot lined up on the guy, but he couldn't because there was someone standing behind the shooter. And, but the shooter saw him with the gun, and a few seconds later he managed to unjam his gun and, and kill himself. The rules changed the minute he saw the other gun. He was no longer in control. He was no longer the only person in the mall with a gun. The rules changed completely. His gun-free zone, three-fire zone, wasn't his anymore. Suddenly there was another person in there with a gun who was going to take him out. And, and he ended it for himself. And didn't even have to, you know, to fire because most of these people that do this are not really brave. They're more insane. But they're not so insane that when they see someone... By the way, the this guy who, who's... who's uh, who did this terrible thing, it was all over in a few minutes because the police got there within a couple of minutes of when this all started. And as soon as the, the authorities got there, he killed himself. There were still a lot of kids in that school. He still could have gone and killed more. But as soon as the authorities got there, he killed himself, just like this guy in that Oregon mall. Now, Governor Perry, who's a good man, and has taken a stand which is not very popular, he said, we should arm the teachers. We should have no such thing as a gun-free zone. We should have exactly the opposite. We should say, if you come here to do wrong, everyone here is in a position to put you out of your miserable life. When I owned a business, and this goes back to when uh, Dr. King, Martin Luther King was killed, and we had rioting in Indianapolis. I owned a business on the south side. I got everyone that I knew, and I knew a lot of people. We got a hold of every gun we had, and there were a lot of guns. We got up on the roof of our single-story building that had a parapet, uh, like a little wall around the top, and we stationed every two feet for the entire perimeter of the building, and it was about, I don't know, 4,000 square foot building, maybe 3,000 square foot, not that big, but it had exposure on all sides. It was a triangle-shaped building. When you looked at this building, you saw what looked like a, a fort in the old days. You know when they used to, ha the, the soldiers would line with, between the pointed uh, logs, there'd be a guy with a rifle, and, the, and mm -hmm. every log on both sides of that point, there was a guy with a rifle. Well, that's what we had. And there was a riot, if you will, in Indianapolis. And they came marching down the main road, 31 Madison Avenue. And when they came down Madison Avenue from, I don't know, 100 feet away, maybe 300 feet away, they saw what looked like Fort Apache. You know that riot stopped? They made a left turn, they went down a different street, and then they came well past us, back on the main street, and kept on marching down. Uh, they had no intention of going by Fort Apache. Now, I say that proudly. 
You know how many people we shot? Nobody. But do you know how many people were not shot? Do you know how many windows were not broken? Do you know how many fires were not set? Do you know how many families were not terrorized? Some, because that entire area where we were, uh, they had no interest in being anywhere near that area. Chief? <clears throat> well, you and Gregor both really hit on uh, some really great um, problems, and the, uh, the solutions to them seem obvious to me. Uh, but I want to throw out something else, too. I, <clears throat> I really believe that the public school let these children down dramatically. And I'm, I'm an advocate now, I've, I've been for a while, of eliminating the government from our education system. We, we have no business with having government-run schools. And so uh, schools should be run by private institutions and or by local communities. And they can decide how they want to protect these schools. But something that could have easily been done, very easily, well, first of all, if you take a school, high school football game, you go to the football game, what do you see all over the place? Police, some type of security. They always hire that for the sporting events, but they don't have those people there for the school activities during the day. Most of the school, public school administrators, most of the teachers don't like the police. They don't want anybody with guns around their buildings, so they keep them away. But that exposes the children, like in this case, to the dangers of someone coming with a gun. But they could easily either just hire police. Most of them have their own police departments anyway, or security, or even another idea, which would cost nothing. You can get volunteers. I'm a retired officer. I'd be glad to volunteer a day and go guard a school. You get people like me. You could, you could get other people. You could get parents and, and other volunteers. Military? Former military, but, but listen to this. Most departments have reserve officers. They cost almost nothing to man them with reserve officers. The difference between anybody and a reserve is only training. That's the only difference. You could train people. They get the same kind of screening the police get. You get, you get l l uh, people that are, that, are, that are qualified, at least uh, with a background check, to be the police, train them how to, uh, how to use guns and protect the building, and have them at the schools. It could be easily done. And that is really a, a community policing issue, and, and that's how it's supposed to be, where the community works together with law enforcement to solve a problem. I saw an article that would take a break. Listen to this. In Israel, every school teacher has a fully automatic weapon with her and a sidearm with her, I say her because most of them are girls or ladies, at all times. In 10 years, surrounded by 250 million idiots, 250 million lunatics, 250 million killer wannabes. Do you know how many kids have been killed? 12 in 10 years. Hello. Now, this school in this rich a suburb, I don't say that in a bad way, just fact, had the state of the art, the best, the bestest security system around. How good is the security system when any idiot, any thug, any moron, any thief, any Democrat, oh, didn't mean to insult the thugs, but with a brick can get in the building? Hello? If there's no one armed to back up the security system, you don't have a security system. You just have a speed bump. It's an That's alarm. all you have it's is an a alarm speed bump. System. What? It's an alarm system. It's, yeah. It's nothing other, other than it alerts somebody that, hey, you're in trouble. But I tell you who to keep out. They'll keep out grandma or grandpa or brother or sister or mom or dad uh, who doesn't have the password uh, because they don't break any rules. If the door's locked, they can't get in. Hmm. Thanks, folks. But I know it hurts. Well, one thing about those Israeli teachers is most of them have served in the Israeli military, so they know exactly what to do with those weapons, too. And they also know what to do with those who would kill their kids. They know what to do with them. Let, let me go back to something that Greg said. Greg talked about his military training, and I have military training, too. But when I was 18, I got married young. When I was 18, just turned 19, I had a wife and a baby, and I got drafted into the Army. And I thank God every day it was one of the best experiences of my life because I was able to go away. I came from a broken home. I was able to go away and see men performing like men, taking care of business, being on time, those types of things. But I also learned a lot of other things that Greg talked about, the, 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 how important life is, the, 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 the sanctity of life and how to discriminate between an enemy and a, and a friendly person and, and don't take that for granted at all. But I think now, after my experience and what we're seeing today, we should reinstitute the draft and start drafting all these young men and put them in the, in the military and give them a, a, a taste of growing up, a taste of manhood, a taste of how you're supposed to do it. Not until you get the queers and, out of the military, because all you're going to do is subject those people to being uh, blackmailed into becoming queers. 
I, I promise you that's what's going to happen to our military. We just had this announcement. This 33-year-old Marine, queer, uh, proposed to his boyfriend in the White House. And since the president used to be a queer, he, of course, just beamed from, well, I better get off the air here before I get too much trouble. We'll be right back with more here on Talk to Solomon. Let me ask you a question. Do you like being sick? I have in my hand an incredible product. It's called TR10 Super Colloidal Silver. TR10 stands for a trace to the negative 10th power. The particles in this silver product are six to eight angstroms, six to eight ten billionths of a meter. Now listen to me. Silver has been the magic bullet for all of human existence. The Egyptians used silver instruments. We use silverware. They put silver in your teeth because nothing can grow on silver. Silver will kill anything but liberalism. I'm working on that. This product, you go to cpnlive.com, buy one quart of this product, it will last you for a very long time. Anytime you feel like you've been exposed to something bad, take some of this product, spray it in your mouth, or take a little bit and gargle it, swallow it, it will kill any pathogen. The average antibiotic kills 10 to 20 different pathogens. This product will kill 700 plus. Do yourself a favor. Do your family a favor. Do your doctor a favor. He's tired of seeing you. Get super colloidal silver. Go to cpnlive.com. Order the product. It's $29.95 plus shipping. I think it's $39.95 delivered any place in America right to your door. It's worth 10 times that. Check it out. If you're not 100% happy, just return it and we'll give you your money back. I like to eat. Do you like to eat? We all do. And usually we run to the grocery store, we run to the convenience store, uh, or we have something in the fridge. But power's been out in parts of this country in the last few weeks. Uh, we don't know what's going to come down the pike economically. Smart people are putting in food. Alpine Air Gourmet Reserves is a line of foods that you can put away that will last for a very long time. You know, they say eat what you store and store what you eat. This is great tasting stuff, healthy for you, a full line. If you go to our website, cpnlive.com, and click on the button for Alpine Air Gourmet Reserves and see all the different things we have. This is good tasting food. It's reasonably priced. It will last. And it's worth its weight in gold if a problem arises. I know you don't think there's going to be anything that goes wrong. Actually, you do. This is smart. This is smart insurance. This is smart preparation. This is smart thinking. You have kids. You have a spouse. You have parents. You have dependents. Uh, you have an appetite. All those things can be addressed by a, a, a frugal but smart investment in Alpine Air Gourmet Reserves. Try them out. You will be tickled to death with the taste of them. You know what? In many cases, people start to eat this, and they think, heck, this tastes better and costs less and what you're going to the grocery store to buy. CPNLive.com. Check it out. Do you like being healthy? I do. In fact, this product, which I've been taking for years now, is absolutely the answer. Now, you may not believe it, but I'm actually 21, plus tax, of course. This product has 146 different healthful nutrients in it. And it's liquid, so it's bioavailable. It tastes great and it's sugar-free. One ounce of Sonic Life each day will help you to maintain and enhance your health. It's the kind of a gift, well, that you'll thank your mom for, your husband for, your wife for, your kids for. Whoever you give it to, they're going to say thank you, and you are going to enjoy the benefits of having all the vitamins, all the minerals, all the nutrients your body needs in one very reasonably priced product. Just go to cpnlive.com, and everything's right there. You'll be able to read all the ingredients. The price is right there, a flat price, delivered to your door anywhere in the United States of America. Sonic Life is a gift, a great gift. Give it to yourself. I do.
you have a computer if you're alive today, which means you have a hard drive, which means it's going to break down. Mosey, the backup people for thousands, for Stan, for thousands of people, for tens of thousands of people, is simply common sense. You go to cpnlive.com, click on the icon for Mosey, the backup people, and sign up. It's, it's just a few dollars a month. Let me tell you something. We had a break-in. They stole our whole computer. You know what? When they take the computer, you can't recover anything, but we had Mosey. We had the backup. We were able to restore everything simply by buying another computer. cpnlive.com, click on the icon for Mosey the backup people, and give yourself common sense, peace of mind, great value, the best thing you've ever done. Sooner or later, it's going to be. Mosey, the backup people.